So let's continue on. So I've just argued how this thing is equal to this far more complicated looking thing. What I can now do is use the triangle inequality on this twice to say that this, which is equal to this, is less than or equal to the modulus of this bit, so f of x minus fn of x, plus the modulus of this bit, so fn at x minus fn at x0, modulus of that, plus the modulus of this bit, which is fn at x0 minus f at x0. And I know, as I've just argued, that all three of these things are strictly less than epsilon over 3, and therefore the sum of them is therefore strictly less than epsilon. So I've just changed that n there to a capital N. It shouldn't have been a lowercase n, it should be a capital N. So that is then how I established that for this delta interval that I found using the continuity of f big N, that um, any point that you take in that delta interval will be mapped into the epsilon interval around f of x0. And therefore I have found a delta interval that satisfies the continuity criterion for f at my point x0. And you can apply this method of finding that delta interval in whatever epsilon you have. So I can therefore conclude that x0 does meet this criterion for uh, the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x being equal to f of x0 and therefore is continuous. The function f is continuous at x0. And as x0 was a general point in the open interval a, b, I can conclude that the function f, my limit function, is continuous over all of that open interval part of my domain. So I just would like to go over that argument again, and in particular I would like to stress how the intuitive argument that I gave with this picture is exactly the same as what we've done here with the magic of the triangle inequality. So we were trying to show then that for a general point x0 in the open interval a, b, that the limit of the function at that point is equal to the value of the function at that point. So we needed to take a general epsilon greater than 0 and find a delta interval around x0 such that that delta interval is mapped entirely into the epsilon interval around f of x0. So here is f of x0, here is the epsilon interval around f of x0. The way that we did this is we used the fact that f is the uniform limit to say I can find this function f big N such that everywhere on the whole of the interval a, b, it is within epsilon over 3 of the limit function f. I also know that all of the functions in my sequence are continuous, so this function f big N is also continuous everywhere and it will be continuous in particular at x0. What I can now do is use the continuity at x0 of f big N to find a delta interval around x0 that is mapped entirely into the epsilon over 3 interval around fn at x0. Now I claim that this delta interval that we get in this way is the delta interval we can use to satisfy our epsilon criterion for the limit function f at x0, i.e. I claim that if you take any point in this interval, then if you look at what f, the limit function, maps it onto, it will be within epsilon distance of f of x0. And the reason that's going to be true is because I know that all the points in here are going to be mapped into this epsilon over 3 interval around fn at x0, and if you think about how far fn at x0 can be away from f of x0, it's less than epsilon over 3. Then, if you think about how far possibly things in this epsilon over 3 interval around fn at x0 can be mapped away from f of x0, it will be epsilon over 3 plus epsilon over 3. So you can see that on this picture, this purple dot could have been let you know it could go right up to epsilon over three. It can't get to epsilon over three away, but it could get very very close to epsilon over three away. Then you can go a further, less than epsilon over three, further away from that. So overall, the distance that 
this point could possibly have been mapped in onto by f big n is going to be at most, or it's going to be less than, 2 epsilon over 3, so 2 thirds of epsilon. Finally, I'm not interested in what fn maps my point onto, I'm interested in what f maps my point onto, but I know that fn and f are always within epsilon over 3 of one another, therefore if I know that my point can be mapped less than 2 epsilon over 3 away from f of x0 by fn, I can therefore conclude that f can map it less than 2 epsilon over 3 plus a further epsilon over 3 away. So it's going to be less than epsilon. And that's what we've overall done here. We've divided it into those separate distances that we, all, we know are all less than epsilon over 3. So here, this is the distance between fn x0 and f of x0. So that's that first epsilon over 3 we discussed. Here, this is the difference between fn of the point x in my delta interval and fn x0. So that's the second epsilon over 3, which is this epsilon over 3 interval around fn at x0. And then finally, this is the final epsilon over 3 that we discussed, which is how far away possibly could the limit function, what the limit function maps my point x onto, be away from what my function fn maps my point onto. And as I've just discussed, because I know fn is in my blue tube around f, that also is less than epsilon over 3. So those are the three distances that we've divided this into, and we've made all of them less than epsilon over 3, and we chose epsilon over 3 precisely because of this, or I chose it because I knew what, uh, where we were going with this. So I manufactured this to work. Um, so I found that quite difficult to explain, but I hope I've managed to communicate my point to you. So what we now know is that any point x0 in the open interval AB, for any epsilon greater than 0, you can always find this delta interval such that that delta interval around x0 is entirely mapped into the epsilon interval around f of x0, and hence you can conclude that the epsilon delta definition for this limit is satisfied, so the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x is equal to f of x0 for all x0 is an element of the open interval AB, and hence uh, my limit function f is continuous everywhere in that open interval AB. So we only need to now consider the endpoints, which are just slightly special cases because you just have to change things to one-sided limits. Um, but I hope you appreciate how, in our argument here, we needed the uniform convergence criterion and we needed all of the functions in our sequence to be continuous everywhere over the closed interval AB. So finally, to finish then, I will consider the special case of the boundary points. I'll only do one of these, because with one you'll get the idea. So we'll take the boundary point A. It's exactly the same idea, we just now need to make things one-sided rather than two-sided. So we want to show then that our limit function f is continuous at the point A, so we want to show that the limit as x approaches A of f of x is equal to f of A. Now just apply the epsilon delta definition of this, and it means that we need for all epsilon greater than zero, so I will take an epsilon greater than zero, and I need to be able to find a half interval now, uh, and I can include the centre point A because of the fact that it will always satisfy this criterion because it's being mapped onto the centre point of the epsilon interval around f of A. Um, so I need to find a half interval from A to A plus delta, um, a delta half interval, such that this is entirely mapped into the epsilon interval around f of a. So again, what I will do is apply uniform convergence and say that I can find a function in the sequence, which again I'll call f big n, such that all along the domain it is within epsilon over 3 distance of the limit function f. So in particular, this f big n, if we look at what it is at what it maps a onto, and compare that to what the limit function maps a onto, 
the distance between those two will be less than epsilon over 3, which is nicely shown on the picture here. Here is A, here is F of A, here is F big N at A, and it's within the epsilon over 3 uh, blue tube that is shown here. Now what we do is again we use the continuity of Fn uh, over the whole of the interval AB, in particular it's going to be continuous at our point A, and we say, therefore, if I take an epsilon over 3 interval around Fn at A, which is what I've shown here, this purple dot is meant to represent Fn at A, it's not quite on it, I don't think, uh, but never mind. And then these lines are meant to represent the epsilon over 3 interval around Fn at A. So because this function is continuous at A, uh, it means that I will be able to find a half delta interval, so an interval from A, including A, to A plus delta, such that everything in there is mapped into this purple interval here. So writing that down, I know that if you take any x in this delta interval, then if you look at what the difference between fn at x and fn at a is, the modulus of that, it's going to be less than epsilon over 3. And then now my claim is that this delta interval that I found using the continuity of fn is the delta interval that will work to show the continuity of f um, at a i.e. for my epsilon here, I can use this delta interval and everything in here will be mapped into the epsilon interval around f of a um, by the function f. And that's what I've put on this picture here. So these black lines, these are supposed to represent the epsilon interval around uh, f of a, which is around here on the picture. And the reason that that delta interval is going to work is because if I do take any x in that delta interval and I look at what is the modulus of the difference between f of x and fn of x, so what the limit function maps x onto and my function fn maps x onto, I know that that has to be less than epsilon over 3 because of the fact that fn is always within epsilon over 3 of f, no matter what x you choose. So in particular, for, for any x in this delta interval, this will be true. And then I can therefore conclude that the difference between f of x and f of a for an x in this delta interval must be less than epsilon because it must be less than or equal to the sum of all of these three things uh, by the argument that we went over here. Um, that, you know, if you imagine merging all of these three together, get rid of the modular sign and just have one modular sign around the whole thing, then this will cancel with this, this will cancel with this, and you'll just end up with modulus of f of x minus f of a. So by the triangle inequality, that must be less than or equal to the sum of these three things. And as these three things are all strictly less than epsilon over 3, I can conclude that mod of f of x minus f of a is less than the sum of the three epsilon over 3s, which is, of course, epsilon. So for a general epsilon, I have shown you how to find this half delta interval such that everything inside there is mapped into the epsilon interval around f of a. Uh, by the function f, and hence this satisfies the epsilon delta criterion for us to say that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a. Therefore, the function is continuous at the boundary point a, and the argument would be exactly the same for the boundary point b, except that you'd obviously have to uh, do intervals the other way, half intervals going the other way rather uh, than in the forward direction as we did for a, it would need to be going in the backward direction for b. So overall, I think we have done then. We have proven the uniform limit theorem as stated here, that if you have a sequence of functions over the interval a, b that are continuous over that interval, and they converge uniformly to some function f, then you can conclude that that function must be continuous everywhere over the interval a, b. And with that, we'll finish there. Thank you very much for watching.